Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. I want to let you know, first of all, this morning, that our next Victorious Faith service in North Denver in Thornton is this Saturday, May 20th at 630 p.m. Our next Victorious Faith service in North Denver in Thornton. In uh, Thornton this Saturday, May 20th at 6.30 p.m. We'll be meeting again at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites on the northeast corner of 120th Avenue and Grant Street. So come and join us this Saturday for our service. It'll be blessed, anointed, full of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that will bring light and revelation. Come and join us. You'll be blessed and glad you came. If you need prayer, we're there to pray with you, pray for you, agree with you for the victories and breakthroughs you need in your life. So that's this Saturday, May 20th at 6.30 p.m. You can go to my website at www.victoriousfaith. Dot co v i c t o r i o u s faith f a i t h dot c o c o like Colorado. Go to the itinerary page and see the details of the time and location. This Saturday, May twentieth, in North Denver, in Thornton, at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites, and there's also a link there for the map and directions. We look forward to seeing you this Saturday at 630 for our anointed service. You'll be blessed and glad you came. Now we are studying the subject of healing and we are still on the sub, uh, the lesson why some people do not get healed. Why some people do not get healed. We have been on the subject of healing for eight months. We've been on this lesson for three months. And so in all that time, three months of teaching, we have covered a lot of scriptures, a lot of details, a lot of explanations. And so if this is your first day to join us, You've missed a lot already. And so I encourage you to go to the radio broadcast archives that are on my website, www.victoriousfaith.co. Go to the radio broadcast archives and go back and listen to the last eight months of teachings on healing and now why some people do not get healed. And if you've not been with us on these teachings, I'm sure you have questions about healing. Everybody does. And why don't some people get healed? Why are there Christians who are sick and they pray for healing and don't get healed? Well, most Christians are unaware that there really are reasons and even though they might say, well, there's a reason. Their assumption is God has a reason. God has a purpose. It's God's plan and God's will. It is absolutely not God's plan. It is absolutely not God's will. Healing is provided, already finished in redemption. In the, the shedding of Jesus' blood. The same blood that forgives your sins also heals your body. We have spent eight months talking about that. I cannot spend eight months right now in this program to remind you and review all of it for you. That's why I go back and listen to the last eight months of teachings. However, to really get the full understanding, even for this lesson that we're on, why some people do not get healed. It's related to the, what we've been teaching for the last three and a half years from the very first that we started this radio program. It has been teaching line upon line about the kingdom of God. Most Christians do not understand the kingdom of God or the spiritual laws of the kingdom. That is foundational to understanding why some people don't get healed because people don't get healed because of not understanding the spiritual laws that govern the kingdom of God, which therefore it governs healing and people don't know those spiritual laws. And so they don't use them 
And so they don't get healed. So we have taught on the kingdom of God. We've taught seven primary spiritual laws of the kingdom, which are the law of love, the law of faith, the law of the creative power of words, the law of authority and dominion to rule on the earth. And especially in this case, rule over your own body. And then the law of sowing and reaping, the law of wisdom, which is being led by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. And then the law of obedience, number seven. All of these spiritual laws are interrelated and interdependent. They all work together. However, we must study them individually to understand how to work each one of them individually. And as I've said many times, even though we look at what we call seven primary spiritual laws, I know that there are many more spiritual laws than seven. But I am also convinced that all other spiritual laws can be tied to one of the seven, one or more of the seven primary spiritual laws. And so that's why when we do study these seven primary spiritual laws, we actually then study branches of other laws that are joined to these seven primary. And so in the last few weeks, we've been looking at why some people do not get healed. Reason number eight, and it's because of not walking in love, which is one of the primary spiritual laws, not walking in love. And for that, you cannot blame ignorance because pretty much every Christian, as soon as you get saved, you hear about love and you hear about walking in love. And so you cannot blame ignorance of love. It is therefore failure to do failure to walk in love. And then last week we were looking at, well, we started out looking at the two kinds of love, recognizing there is the God kind of love. And then there is human love. The God kind of love is unselfish, sacrificial, a choice, a quality decision, not based on feelings. It is covenantal commitment. It is eternal. And then the human love, it is selfish. It is based on feelings. It is fickle. It is here one moment, gone the next. You some, you fall in love. You fall out of love. It is based on feelings. And so to walk in love continually, you cannot walk in human love which is common to all humans, but you must walk in the God kind of love, which is not common. It comes from God and therefore you must receive it from God. It is one of the fruit of the spirit, meaning it is born in you, planted in you, birthed in you when you are born again. So before you're born again, you do not have the God kind of love. But when you're born again, the God kind of love is born in you, birthed in you, planted in your spirit when you're born again. But then it's planted in you as a seed. All the fruits of the spirit are planted in your spirit as a seed. And you must water it, feed it, practice it, develop it, developing by practice and exercise. Just like the physical body, how do you strengthen the body by food and exercise, food and exercise? And if you never eat, your body gets weak. If you never exercise, your body atrophies. If you lay in bed for a year, your muscles will atrophy. Well, in the same way, spiritually, if you never feed the fruit of the spirit with the the word of God, feed your love, feed joy, feed peace. Don't ever say, I just don't have patience. 
If you're born again, you do have patience. It's in you as a seed. You have to develop it. Don't say you don't have it. You do have it if you're born again. But you feed it with the word of God and you practice and exercise, practice and exercise, practice and exercise, just like muscles. You wouldn't look at one person who is a bodybuilder and they're constantly lifting weights. And now they this man can lift 250 pounds and say, well, I just don't have muscles like he does. Well, you have the same muscles in you. You just have not developed them. And it's the same way with all the fruit of the spirit. You cannot say that God has given one person more faith. And a lot of Christians ignorantly say that they're, they're wrong. They say, well, God just gives that one a super faith. That person, God gave more faith. No, no. No, no, no. He gave everybody. He gives all Christians the seed. It's a seed of faith. And you feed it and water it by studying and meditating the word of God. And you practice and exercise it so it develops and becomes stronger. So those people that you look at and you think, oh, they've got great faith. They've got super faith. God did not give them extra or more. They exercised, they practiced and practiced until it grew and developed and became stronger. You need to do the same. You need to feed and exercise and practice your faith so your faith grows. Well, in the same way, you must feed your love with the word of God. The word of God is spirit food. The Bible calls the scriptures water and milk and meat. So it's the water of the word, the milk of the word and the meat of the word that you study, meditate, feed your spirit, feed your love, feed your faith with the word of God. And then what do you do? You put it in practice, put it in practice, exercise it every day. And the more you practice, the more proficient, you become the stronger your faith grows, the stronger your love grows by practice and all the fruit of the spirit grow by feeding and practicing them. And so you cannot say you don't have it. You do have it. As a matter of fact, the Bible also says in Romans chapter five, verse five, Chapter five, verse five says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us or another translation. God's love. God has poured out his love into our hearts. His love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. The Holy Spirit, and it's the fruit of the Spirit. So God has given us His love. So this is not the human love, which is fickle, selfish, here one moment, gone the next. This is God's love, which is eternal, unmoving, steadfast, committed, and not based on feelings, unselfish, giving, sacrificial love. It is God's love. It is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And then last week also we were seeing this characteristic of love. Love is humble. And love and humility go hand in hand, just like pride and selfishness go hand in hand. Pride is self-exaltation. Selfishness is putting self first. So selfishness is pride. Selfishness is pride. And in the same way, love is humble and walking in humility is love. They go hand in hand because humility lowers yourself and pride exalts yourself. And so we see we were reviewing actually last week. What was a multiple week series, I think five or six weeks last year that I taught on pride and humility. 
And as I said then, as I said last week, I, even though I've been born and raised in church all my life, have not heard but one Bible teacher teach and preach at length about pride. I've heard one from whom I learned this and started my study and and grew in it from studying it further. But I had one Bible teacher who studied a ser- who taught a series on pride. It impacted me greatly, opened my eyes to see a deadly, deadly, deadly enemy called pride. Because pride is the root of all sin. It is the cause of all sin. Every sin stems from pride. Every sin. Every sin. Any sin you could name stems from pride. Pride was the cause for the fall of Satan. Lucifer, he was called in heaven when he was cast down. It was because of pride. And pride was also the cause of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says that pride comes before a fall. So pride causes a fall and it, the Bible says pride brings destruction. So every fall, including Satan's fall, including Adam and Eve's fall and the human race and every fall since Adam to the present day, even anybody, you know, today who has fallen, it is because of pride. Every destruction is because of pride. Pride brings destruction. However, pride is so deadly because it blinds the one who has it. It is deceptive. The one who has it is blind to it, cannot see it. So it is the most dangerous because when you're committing adultery, you can see that. When you're committing fornication, you can see that. When you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, that is visible. Even when you're in strife, you're, that's visible. When you argue, it's visible. But guess what is invisible? Pride. Pride is invisible. It is the invisible root and cause of all sin. And you must learn to see it and identify it first and only in yourself. When you start learning the characteristics of pride, what pride looks like, how pride talks and how pride acts, you will also get begin seeing it in other people. But you must ignore it and overlook it in everyone else because that's love and you must see it, identify it and kill it in yourself. Overlook it in everybody else, but identify it and kill it in yourself. And we see, we read in James four, six and first Peter five, five, that God opposes the proud. That is even Christians who are proud and don't think that Christians aren't proud. Most everybody is very proud until they study humility because humility will only come not by accident, not by chance, not because you call yourself a Christian, but only by diligent effort, recognizing it every moment that it pops its ugly head, you identify it and you kill it moment by moment, diligently, conscientiously. And if you're not conscientiously looking for and identifying and killing pride in yourself, then you have a bunch of it that's unchecked, a bunch of it running rampant in you. If you're not conscientiously looking for it and crucifying it. 
It is big. Everybody has it, and it is only killed by conscientious, determined, diligent effort, moment by moment, to crucify the flesh and put it down. Put it down, put it down, put it down every moment. And you can walk in love and humility one moment, be so sweet, and then get angry and be selfish the next moment. And so it really is a moment by moment work of diligently crucifying and putting to death pride in yourself. And because people are ignorant of it, it is deceptive and it blinds the one who has it. Everybody has it until they are identifying it and crucifying it. And that's very few people who really are looking for it, who really are identifying it in themselves and crucifying it. Very few even know about it. And that's why most are not finding it and killing it. So pride is running rampant. It is running rampant in Christians. And so when the Bible says God opposes the proud, he's there are Christians that God is not on their side because they are in pride. And God gives grace to who? To the humble. God gives grace to the humble. And if you ever thought about God, why aren't you on my side? Why aren't you helping with me with this? Well, then you must look and find it's probably you are in pride. You're in pride and God opposes the proud. God only gives grace to the humble. And we read in first Peter five, five, that you must clothe yourselves yourself, that is, remember, with humility toward one another. And then verse six says, humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand. And Christians who are praying, God, humble us, God, humble us. God is not going to humble you. He's not. It's your job. You humble yourself under God's mighty hand. There is no scripture that says that commands God is going to humble you for you. No, it all says humble yourself. Again, in James four, back to James four, where we read God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble in verse six. Well, verse 10 says the same thing. Humble yourselves before the Lord. So it's in James. It's in first Peter. James 4, 6 and 4, 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. First Peter 5, 6, humble yourself before the Lord. And first Peter 5, 5, clothe yourself with humility. You crucify pride in you. That is where you take up your cross daily. You crucify your flesh. You put to death the misdeeds of your body. And that is related, as we read last week, to Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. So right there, it talks about devoted to one another in brotherly love. Then the next sentence, honor one another above yourselves. Above yourselves, above yourself, above yourself, honor others above yourself. That is humbling yourself before others, honor them above yourself. That is love. Love is humility. Humility is walking in love, honoring others above yourself, clothing yourself with humility, lowering yourself before others, preferring others over yourself is walking in love. Being selfish is walking in pride. Selfishness is pride. And because it is so deadly, it is very serious. And because most people do not even know hardly anything about pride, except they can recognize boasting 
boasting is is pretty well obvious people boasting about what they've done and most people really only recognize boasting as pride and then they say well i don't boast so i'm not in pride wrong 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 there's a lot more to pride than just boasting anytime you're selfish you're in pride any sin you commit is committed in pride. Pride is the root cause of every sin. And so in order to be free from sin, you actually need to be free from pride. You need to crucify pride. And so that's why, again, I recommend go back to my website, victoriousfaith.co and go to the radio broadcast archives and study what I taught a year ago on the subject of pride and humility. Pride brings destruction. Pride comes before a fall. Every fall is because of pride. Every destruction is because of pride. And the reason there is so much sickness in the body of Christ today in Christians is because of pride. And the reason that a lot of Christians do not get healed is because of pride. If you want to get healed, if you want to get victory, you need to learn to identify pride and walk in humility. So study it and join me again tomorrow. Remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.